You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. Today I have the huge privilege of speaking with the usually talented Amanda Sillers, an investment manager and ESG director of Jupiter Independent Funds team, which manages nearly 7 billion in the Jupiter Merlin range of portfolios. In June, 2021, she was given the additional responsibility of ESG director at Jupiter. Jupiter Funds team and Amanda has over 26 years of investment industry experience and alongside her colleagues have several decades of industry experience between them ensuring a team that is completely focused on generating outperformance for their clients using the multi-manager concepts after fees over time and a hardened proponent of team management, active stewardship and transparency. Welcome, Amanda. Well, thank you, Peter. You make me sound terribly old. <laughs> no, no, terribly experienced. You know, no, this is what I'm, you. That's what I'm focused on and talented. <laughs> well, yes, that's so. Uh... That was very kind. <laughs> right. So in this conversation, we're going to discuss, Amanda, your, your journey in the investment industry thus far, lessons learned, experiences gained, your investing style and your passion for all things ESG and for delivering long-term success for investors via Jupiter Merlin's portfolio and much more. Okay. So so welcome. I want, I want to say, firstly, um, it was absolutely fabulous to meet and speak with you and your team at the and your Merlin uh, colleagues at uh, Leicester recently. Uh, thank you ever so much for just deigning me with your your present and naturally allowing me to, to speak with you on the day. And I'm so pleased that you're you're here with us today. Thank you very much for that. Not at all. Thank you. And actually, to be honest, I think at that meeting you had John Chatfield Roberts presenting, and uh, yes, as there were three of us, and he was one. And, and he is he's a real um, deity. It's not me. So, but thank you anyway. Thank you very much. Now, I, I wanted to start this conversation, if I may, with you um, sharing with us your transition from attaining a BA honours degree in arts history to your first job in the investment industry. How did that come about, Amanda? Yeah, no, it's it's really unusual. I, I frankly, I never even considered finance or the city or anything like that as a career. I was always very much on the arty side. And um, it wasn't till I met someone who said, Amanda, do you have any idea what the city actually does? And I said, yes, it's all focused on money. And I'm not really interested in, frankly, money doesn't really excite me. And I'm not particularly good with figures anyway. And he said, you've got it all wrong. London works on GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. So you've got Asia on one in the morning and you've got the States open in the afternoon. London is the hub for global finance. Secondly, we have a rule of law. So it naturally attracts all these companies to London, to British law. Thirdly, we have English. It is the language, the global language of business. And fourthly, never to be forgotten, every single company requires cash. And he said to me, you, Amanda, you're working here as a waitress because you need cash. Cash is your life. You know, that, that's your oxygen. If you run out of cash, you're useless. And the same is true of a company. So if you have a company that's growing, that's got something really good, it needs cash to grow. And the city can provide that. And he happened to be a fund manager. And he said, so I've got lots of investors who are investing lots of their hard-earned savings with me. And if I can empower the best companies to grow and to make better goods and services and be better for you know, all stakeholders, he didn't use that word because that's that's quite a modern word, but um, for, for everyone, then that's that's a fantastic job that I can do and I can make a real difference. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to find out about the city. How cool. And then in addition, I would say one other thing and I've now fast forwarded, but um, I would also say that another massive thing about city and about investment management and active asset management in the way that we do it for our Jupiter Merlin investors is that if you can add in that fiduciary duty in other words you're saying to a company i think you're so good i want to buy some of your shares i want to have an ownership stake in your business 
Oh, and by the way, that comes with fiduciary responsibility. So I'm going to engage with you, the management of that company, to help you grow and make that company more sustainable over time. I do see it as a partnership. So that last bit he didn't say, but the first bit he did. And so I just suddenly thought, hey, I have no idea what I want to do. I've just finished a degree and uh, to get into the art world is really tough. And by the way, it's uh, it's particularly tough for a girl. It's no tougher in the city. Um, so why not give it a shot? And I suddenly discovered everything he said was right. And therein embarked on an eight year exam, series of exams. Um, no, no, long time. Having said, I would never do another exam after my A-levels. <laughs> I then did a degree and I then did eight years. And yes. um, yeah, so uh, to exact question, I was very lucky um, in that I happened to see an advertisement. I don't know if you remember those old days. Most of your listeners probably won't. They used to be on the back of the Times. There wasn't an internet. There was no, you know, no World Wide Web, anything like that. So it was there was a jobs list at the back of the times and I just saw one for a receptionist and so I went for it. Brilliant. So you started as a receptionist. It mm -hmm. was your very first job. And look at you look at you now, you know, you, you went on to become an executive director at JP Morgan where you spent 15 years uh, at JP Asset Management and JP App, uh, Morgan Private Bank and Flemings respectively. Uh, please share some of your other roles there mm -hmm. and your greatest learnings. And, and did you have any early mentors, Amanda? Yes. To your last question, mentors are so important. And I keep saying to everyone I meet in my mentoring capacity, which seems still to be quite um, big, please get some wonderful mentors. And I genuinely think it should be in the brief of every line manager to make sure each individual who reports to them has good mentors because it's a fabulous relationship. Um, and it, it it flourishes most when it's informal um, because it sort of comes and goes with swings. Sometimes you're fine and sometimes you just need that extra outside input uh, or uh, initiative. Um, and mentors are brilliant to do that. And that's one of the reasons I'm so keen to give back and be a mentor um, and also connect the mentees together as well. It's not just me to them, it's them to me and it's them across mm -hmm. as well. Um, and uh, I've forgotten your first question. I'm sorry, Peter. No, I was going to say with regards to the various roles and your greatest learnings yeah. whilst you were there at, um, at JP Morgan. So various roles. Um, we had quite a lot of M&A, mergers and acquisitions. So we were sort of bought and sold several times. So I had lots of managers, different managers, all going in different directions, wanting different things. So that was quite entertaining oh. and encouraging, coupled with three children as well. Um, I think my greatest learnings were humility, um, that everyone has something really valuable to teach. Um, I should have two of those and one of those. That um, we have in this country an incredible opportunity and we just need to have the hard graft and the, the humility to chase it and just go for it. Don't let any holes be barred. And um, so I think it's humility and it's the opportunity that we have here compared to others. Um, on that latter point, you know, I compare ourselves to other countries. You're not allowed to be a mother and work in Japan. It's socially unacceptable. Um, and to actually have a meaningful job, that's, that's so rare and so, so special. We have a climate that we can live in and work in. We have a rule of law. We have a sensational uh, example of service and diligence and um, integrity from our ruling family. I mean, look how seamless that transition was from the queen to the king. And you look back in history and there's blood on the streets for years. We, we take so much for granted. We take the fact we have water in our taps. Okay, it's costing more, but it's still there. Um, we take the fact we've got a blue sky when we come out in the mornings. Well, I was reading that in um, Mongolia now, the, the solar panels are useless because they've got so much smog from the coal they're selling to China. It's no good. We haven't lost that yet. So mm. I'm forever grateful and forever humble. Thank you for that. Uh, now, I, I wanted to go back a bit, if I may, because you touched on 
your um your passion for mentors and mentoring now during your time at jp morgan you chaired the women's in women's interactive network with over 2000 members please can you tell us the importance of that role and why you got so involved in it at the time sure um, we had 27 offices at the time of the merger of Chase, Fleming and J.P. Morgan. OK, it didn't all come together, but it, essentially it did. And we had a lot of women and a lot of change. And at times of change, it's a really good idea to try and get groups to, to cleave together and try and tackle problems in a combined and effective fashion. And the Women's Interactive Network, WIN, we used to call it, um, had been running for ages and I was invited to be a, a, you know, a member of the group. And then as people sort of left, I suddenly found myself holding the can, which was a bit terrifying actually. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and uh, so we used to probably have a meeting once a month and each of us, there was sort of six of us in the group, um, uh, were invited, invited a senior person to speak twice a year essentially, so sorry, two meetings every year, which was a responsibility. I had to find two speakers every year. And we would typically find the most senior people we could and ask them to come in to all the women and to give a what we called a three plus three minus, which is a typical metric that you use in an appraisal in an American bank. And uh, it was fascinating. Some of these really, really big swinging individuals, I won't use the normal word for that, came in and gave us our gave us a really candid appraisal of their careers and often career advice. So it was really motivating actually. Um, and to your next question, the best piece of advice I ever heard was from the chap who is head of JP Morgan Investment Bank, which at the time was a really, really big deal. And he came in and said, you know, my biggest regret is that my daughter is a composer. And I didn't listen to her. I didn't go along to her concerts and I'll never get that back. And he said, it's all very well to say to people, yes, you can go and collect your kids from school once a month, or you can, you know, to, yes, you've got, you can go to one of the football matches if you've got a son you know, who's playing in a team once a term or whatever. But actually, if you don't set the example from the top, they don't do it. And I just thought, note to self, I'll never be at the top. But I must always remember to try and set the example um, in whatever it is, uh, mm. because actually that's the most effective way of emulating what you're trying to deliver. That's a very good point, very well, well made there, Amanda. And I think you are at the top. And the fact that you've managed to <laughs> maintain 26 years in the industry and raised three children who are equally, you know, doing very, very well at their pursuits. That's that's success in itself. So very, very well done. Well, you're very sweet. My greatest achievement actually is having a wonderful husband and keeping him happy. <laughs> and uh, to yeah. your last point, um, I struggled to get my 18 year old out of bed at times, but there we go. <laughs> it's not straight it's like, success. I can assure you. 18 year olds often have that difficulty, indeed, yes. And then you struggle <laughs> to get them out of bed as well in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to be a strange type of glue there that I haven't yet found. <laughs> yeah, it's the 18 year old syndrome, unfortunately. Now, um, during your time at, um, at JP Morgan, we're going to move on in, in, in a little while from that. Um, obviously, you've got some investing memories and experiences. You experienced the dot com bubble and the global financial crisis of 2007 8. Could you just share some of the experiences of that for the, for the listeners that haven't been through that and are, are seeing um, this current year's volatility and drag on the markets? And they're going, but they haven't really experienced much in comparison to to those sort of episodes. That's true, actually. And this year for bond investors, they're experiencing drawdowns of that size. And I can see so many bond teams, they've never seen drawdowns of 30, 40% before. And it's really shattered them. And equities were used to drawdowns. I mean, I, as you rightly identify, I've been through two of those. Um, so thoughts would be firstly, cleave together. You've got good people in your teams draw them out, work together, get in the office, listen to them, engage them in conversation, because it takes some of the fear out of it. They've seen that, they've been at four, and the fact that they're there means they've survived. So that's a good start. Secondly, try when you're going in to these times, which is always difficult to see, but there are red flags. Listen to the people who are 
really wise and they will show you those red flags. Try to protect capital. If you can preserve capital such that you don't permanently destroy it, then you've got capital invested in the markets at the bottom. You'll never know when the bottom is, so you have to have skin in the game. If you sell at the bottom, you know you've catalyzed the very worst outcomes for your clients. You've, you've literally just managed to crystallize a drop of a third or a half. And that's somebody else's savings. And who knows, they may not be earning. They may be relying on that money for their pension, for college fees. And you've just denied that person that outcome. It's a, an enormous responsibility, but shared amongst many broad shoulders of various age groups is super helpful. Um, and I guess my third point would be just a flashback. It was the 18th of December and my boss and I sat down and went through the funder funds that we were running at the time. In 99, this was, sorry. And um, we suddenly did a tot up and we thought, well, if we look through the holdings, the sector holdings of the 10 funds within this fund of funds, what's our real TMT exposure? Because on paper, it's 21%. But actually, when we added in all the stocks that were being caught in this bubble, which was called TMT um, technology, um, oh God, I can't even remember what it's called now, TMT, anyway. Um, we actually had 35% exposure to this single theme, which had gone up and was trading at PEs of sort of 80, 100, 120, depending on how far you looked. And that's when we cut, big time. And it felt pretty sickening at the time. And often when you're making the right move, you do feel sick for quite a few weeks. But the turn came very quickly at the beginning of 2000. And we were so grateful that we'd actually dug deeper and had a look and understood. We get transparency through all the portfolios that are in the Jupiter Merlin portfolios, for example, and indeed all the funds that used to be in the, the product we managed at JP Morgan. And um, it's that granular depth of knowledge that is invaluable, particularly when there's something you know not right in the market and you've just got to dig, out, dig at it like a sort of ferret, trying to find out what's going on and what the impact might be and make sure you're in the right position. I love that reply. And something you said there that really, really resonates with me as well. It's the difficulty of selling. You know, we, we do that. Re we do. We all do the research. Fund managers do the research, and it almost feels easier to find the best quality and then make a purchase. But the difficulty of all that research then going, hmm, now the market's gone a certain way. We need to extract ourselves. That's often a very, very difficult path to to go down for for everybody, even the most experienced fund managers. Which is one of the reasons on the Merlin team, because it's other people's money. OK, we've got our money in it, too, but it's mostly others, obviously. We always wait for an inflection point to have happened. We don't prejudge it because we can't. I can't see into, um, you know, Jay Powell's head. And nor can I, even if I could. And he, you know, the governor of the, the, the US Federal Reserve, who's going to change interest rates. I don't know if he's going to change interest rates tomorrow. And even if I could would I know which way the market would respond? It's not always intuitive. It's really interesting. However clever you think you may be, you're always shown, actually, you're really not. And the market is far more powerful than you are, which is why one of the traits that really upsets me when I listen to fund managers is any arrogance. If there's any hint of arrogance, I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm out of that meeting in about 10 minutes. Um, it's a really dangerous characteristic. And I think the same is true perhaps in any profession. You know, if you're not listening to what's going on around you in the marketplace and amongst your customers particularly, they're your vital feedback loop. It's them you're serving. If you fail to listen to the people you're serving, what what service are you, prepare, you, know, are you, are you performing for them? What value does it add? Very good point. I'm going to be I'm going to be touching on characteristics and traits a bit a bit later on. I want to talk, I want to speak now, if I may, with regards to your 15 years at J.P. Morgan, and then you you joined Jupiter um, in 2011. Uh, given how vastly qualified and experienced you were already, what attracted you to to Jupiter at the time, um, Amanda? So um, you're so switch. I didn't consider myself to be vastly qualified at the time, but um, this team have always been the best. 
in fund of funds. They, they, they used to be a triumvirate of three and they very much sat on a pedestal. So all the sort of conferences I used to go to and the peer group, they were seldom there because they were so busy. And if they wanted to see anyone, they would literally pick up a telephone and any manager would be there faster than the taxi could drive, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so to try and get into their front door was lit. There were the queues all the way down the street. Why? Brilliant. Because they delivered to their clients in a transparent, simple, effective after fee revenue stream that satisfied their financial desires. And secondly, because they made a real effort to meet their clients. So they would have roadshows going up and down the country, meeting all their clients, um, their investors, twice a year. And they would write handwritten letters to every single attendee wow. after they came. And um, to give you an insight, when I joined in 2011, we were having a thousand people at every roadshow. And you met us at one of those roadshows. So yeah. you know exactly the type of forum with sort of 30, 40, 50 people. And he, they would write after every single roadshow, seeing you know 17 different venues. So it was that connection with the individuals. They understood the privilege and the responsibilities they were carrying by, by being entrusted by these people with their precious hard-earned savings. And I think it's that link. I wasn't dealing anymore with a piece of paper which had a pension scheme figure on it. I wasn't dealing with trustees who are arm's length from the members of a pension scheme. Um, it was actually the hands-on. And I can tell you, Peter, you would enjoy this particular story. I was in Exeter um, about two years ago presenting. Actually, no, it was three. It was just before the lockdown. And this wonderful chap, don't ask me his name because I have a memory like a sieve from, from names unless they're actually managers. And he came up to me and he shook me warmly by the hand. He said, Amanda, I'm so excited. I've just had my first grandson. And I wow. said, I'm overjoyed for you. How exciting. And he said, yes. And he's already an investor in Jupiter Merlin Growth. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought to myself, okay, so my time frame has now gone from your lifetime, which is probably another 20 or 30 years, to probably 90. I'm not going to be here in 90 years' time. How am I going to service that, that little boy <laughs> effectively? It was, um, so there's, it's, a, it's a hugely, hugely special place to be. It's a huge responsibility when you're not working with an incredible team. And that's why I wanted to work with the team, because they're just, they are the best. Great product great team great house and it still is to, so that's great I've, I've, met, I've met them and yeah it's a fantastic team now the the team manages nearly seven billion um in a, under assets and management for jupiter merlin um the range of portfolios please can you give us an overview of the team the structure and its philosophy you've touched on a little bit of it, of it there as well and i'm sure that still you know continues on Okay, lots of questions there, Peter. So I'll try and touch on each one briefly. The range is six portfolios, each with a different risk reward profile to suit everyone from grannies through to that little boy. So different ranges of risk. Um, and therefore they have a different composition of fixed interest, equities, and other assets. Um, philosophy is the only person who matters is the clients. Um, and that if we do well by our current clients, hopefully we'll, we'll attract future clients. And we do that by delivering an after fee revenue and re return profile that allows those individuals to um, not diminish the real spending power of those assets. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you could invest a certain tranche of money, I think our average investors got about 25 or 30 thousand pounds with us okay one has got 100 million we know that but um the average is about 25 or 30 thousand and we know that if we can over time increase the value of that money after fees then hopefully they can achieve their own financial objectives which gives them surety and that's really valuable um and so we try and do that by adopting a robust and repeatable investment process, whereby we have a look at the world and say, okay, these are the things that are going on at the moment. So for example, an easy one, we've got 
rampant inflation. So in an inflationary environment, how which asset classes are likely to outperform and which are likely to underperform? And therefore, we try and skew the portfolios to the asset classes that are most likely to deliver a positive return and take assets away, remove money from the asset classes that are going to underperform. Easier said than done. And, um, and then over time, we have, I think, a perfect combination of you've got our team of six people who are focused on this. We live, we breathe, we eat this. This is our passion. This is our day and job is to serve those clients. But you've also got the underlying managers. And they're good. They've got a proven track record of outperformance. So from an, your perspective, if you, you, Peter, are an investor or anybody else listening, you've got an insurance policy, actually. And you always pay a little bit money for insurance, but it's worth it when the rain comes. So the insurance policies that you've got us overlooking, and it's our this is what we've done for the last 21 years, and we've got a track record going back that long. But even if we get it wrong, which we do, all the other underlying managers, of which there are at the moment typically 13 or 14 funds within the portfolios, they won't all get it wrong. And I think that's a really, that, that allows me to sleep at night. It's one of the two things that allows me to sleep at night. The other one is that we're not in passives. We're not in structured products. We haven't put any of the money into derivatives. We know what we put other people's money into. Whereas with so many other products, they're really complicated and they're really confusing. If I don't understand them, how on earth are our clients supposed to understand them? Yet alone, a lot of, often IFAs who are explaining them to clients. Well, if you know, if it's fiendishly complex and leveraged, and you just never know what's coming next. <laughs> the markets are quite difficult enough already. <laughs> and, and your last question was to team. So, algae. John and Pete were the triumvirate. They were the three musketeers who nobody could touch. Um, Pete, bless him, resigned about, or he retired actually about six years ago now, but he's still a consultant. And actually I think Alton, and John have got lunch with him this week, if I'm right. He lives up in Yorkshire. And so they just travel north because they all live out quite a long way out. Um, and then, so they were the three. And then when I met them, I, in my first meeting with them actually i said you know i would adore to join you obviously who wouldn't um and i don't mind what i do i can happily make the tea i really don't mind i just would love to come and join you but i can't solve your problem and these lovely triumvirate looked at me slightly askance and said well what's that and i said well i'm not dissimilar in age <laughs> you were all roughly the same age um and hey ho, the next thing I heard, they were taking two of us. Yay! So here come mm -hmm. Dave, came David, and David is now my boss. He's fabulous, incredible guy, um, and he is now co-head with with um, John, which is brilliant. And and then George has come up very fast on the inside track. He was a grad who we took uh, four years ago now, mm -hmm. and he's just come up so fast but i'm not going to keep singing his praises because he might be listening to this interview in due course and then alistair joined us as a cpm a client relationship manager so if any of our clients have got colleagues who they want to um, learn about uh, they want to teach them about jupiter merlin portfolios they literally pick up the telephone and says alistair come up to timbuktu come and tell us about it and he said right i'll go so he's on the road all the time so whilst when he's in the meeting, when he's in the office, he comes to our meetings, but he's not core it. Whereas we all attend the meetings and we all want to be there because we all want to know what's going on in those portfolios and those funds. Brilliant. Was that it? I mean, Did I miss anything, Peter? Was it, that was that exactly it. Absolutely brilliantly said and, and, and quoted. And you, you've answered it perfectly. I want you to touch on this. This is the nuance of what, what it means to be successful, Amanda. The Jupiter Independent Funds team have won over 15 multi-manager awards in the past 10 years so clearly what you and your team are doing is absolutely phenomenal and um if you can just share some of the secrets of your success for the others that haven't attained that many awards so far what's the secret 
Wow, good question. I would say make sure your product works for your clients. It's got to be something that is fantastic for them because if it isn't, there is no reason they should buy it and there's every reason they should sell it and therefore you have nothing, however good you may be. Um, and secondly, you've got to work with a good team. I really want to see the team. I would love to have them for dinner, 100% with their other halves. Um, and thirdly, I think to be a really strong team member, you've got to be really humble. And an easy example, but not one that really hurt, but an easy example from the outside was when David was promoted over me. I probably sulked for about one minute, <laughs> but that was all because I was just so delighted. He's, the, you know, he's an amazing guy and actually he's younger and we need to grow him. So that's really, really cool. Um, but actually things do hit you a broadside, particularly actually funny enough when you come back from, from maternity leave. Things don't go to plan often and you've just got to sit there and think, hold on, I'm incredibly lucky to be where I am. I've got a lot going on at home. I haven't got time to shift jobs. Let's not even try it. Give this my best shot. And if in a year's time, X is still happening or Y is still not great, maybe then consider it. But you know, your battery by that time is quite thin. So don't stress it by being, oh, well, you know, I could do this better. And how's this all happen when I was away? You know, <laughs> it doesn't work. So that would be probably my messages to other women. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, I wanted to touch on this because it's, it's quite clear um, that you and your team continue to find talented individuals across the portfolios that have a long-term <laughs> ability to add value and beat the market. And you touched on characteristics earlier of which ones you would avoid. Um, please, would you share with us the winning characteristics, the recurring characteristics and traits that you've found in fund managers over the years? And also um, Merlin, of course. Um, yes, with pleasure, Peter. Although it's an inexhaustive, it's an inexhaustive list. There's an awful lot, which is why having really strong cognitive diversity on a team really helps. Um, but I would say at the very top of that list are, is a really robust investment process. Secondly, I would say portfolio construction is critical and it's very frequently overlooked. And what do I mean by portfolio construction? I mean, having the right percent within a portfolio of percent of a portfolio in a certain market or fund. Um, so thirdly, if you find a manager who's got a really consistent investment process, really strong portfolio construction characteristics, an amazing team, because one person is never a good thing. You always want a combination of great, great minds. Um, then from our perspective, what we can do is we can hold a fund for a long period of time and then just sort of increase it when the time is right for it and decrease it when it's not. So for example, Fund Smith, which many of your viewers will know is a top performing large cap growth concentrated portfolio run by a very charismatic and successful um, individual called Terry Smith. Um, it was off the charts. It delivered fabulous returns for our clients for many, many years. We invested with the strategy when it was, I think, 200 million in size, and it's now 24 billion sterling. And we held an awful lot in that, in, as a percent of our portfolios when the market was rising and it was being led by that type of style. But then when we had the vaccine news, uh, which from memory was November 2021, uh, when we suddenly had that news that we got that vaccine, which was fantastic, um, we recognized we were in a new growth cycle and we switched into values. So we reduced down dramatically that exposure. Now we still have small exposure to that portfolio. We still believe his investment process, you know, everything that, you know, they, they, they are doing what they're saying on the tin, but it's the wrong time to own that style. So consistency of style really helps. Um, but there's so many other things as well. You've got to find an, 
uh, uh, ultimately a team that wants to win, a team that's really hungry but not greedy. If they're greedy, they'll take too many assets. If they're hungry, they'll work at it all the time. They'll think and breathe it. You're walking down the street and you, you see a sign and think, oh, that links back to that. Yes, that works. So maybe that'll have an impact on that investment sort of thing. So there are lots and lots of different characteristics. Um, and each member of our team is looking for something slightly different. But that's great. Because when we all reach the same decision, we can put more money behind it. It's a more robust decision. Brilliant. I think so, that goes to, back to this nuance that I keep seeing repeated over again, the importance of diversity of thoughts, you know, to have that sort of balance of, across the team where everyone's looking at things slightly differently, but you come out and find the gems that way. So, so Amanda, talking about shrewd moves, during 2021, yourself and your team made a very bold and it turned out a very shrewd move by exiting Chinese equities. Do you recall what red flags, sorry, I couldn't resist, um, you and your team were seeing at the time that led to that change of investing strategy? Yes. Um, to be honest, we'd been bridling with it for quite a long time. We are increasingly and intrinsically um, more and more concerned about the E and the S. Um, and I'm not going to use inflammatory language because it's not helpful, but let's put it in really mundane language, their track record from an environmental and a social governance led a lot, um, I don't know how to put it politely, uh, was not great. Um, and the final straw was the Common Prosperity uh, um, initiative that President Xi announced. And within three working days, which, in, sorry, three days, which included a weekend, I can't remember the figure, but it was billions and billions of RMB, Chinese renminbi, have been divested from companies by their founders and their owners and the, 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 the agents, you know, the management of those companies and invested in social projects, schools, hospitals, all, a whole series of different things, which from a philanthropic perspective is very laudable, but from a governance perspective is just highlighted to us yet again that Chinese companies are required by law to prioritize the will of the CCP. And the state-owned enterprises have to have one, if not two members of the CCP on their board. And the state-owned enterprises, we know a huge number, a huge percent of the index, and indeed they're very, very big heavyweights within that index. The social contract in China is that you need to do as you are told. You don't ask questions, you jump and say, how high? And is the person next to me jumping higher? Because if so, I've got to jump higher. Whoever thinks that shareholders are primary is mistaken. It's, it's in law. It's written. It's totally clear and transparent. And secondly, as a, as a foreign minority shareholder, are you really going to be listened to? Can you genuinely say you have any influence and you can work in partnership with the underlying company? Can you genuinely attest to the E policies or the environmental or the social policies or indeed the governance. So honestly, it wasn't a difficult decision to make. We think it's dangerous to invest money in, an, in a, a, a command economy such as that. And if anything, actually, it's been very interesting to watch the ramifications of the war in Ukraine, whereby one needed you know, suddenly Russian invest investments became uninvestable and you couldn't withdraw your money from them. Um, a lot of people are saying, might that happen if, well, when really, China annexes Taiwan? Question really is how are they gonna do it? And what would, the, you know, what would the ramifications and the impact be on the Western world, yet alone Western investors? So we have the luxury of global mandates amongst the portfolios, we can invest people's money in safer areas so why wouldn't we so mm. I, that's a really long answer but it's uh something that that really troubles us and really worries us um but it is a very unusual view and it was even more unusual when we made it i can assure you 
No, but I mean, the, the essence of it was you, you took up the role around May, June of 2021 um, as the ESG director, and that's part of your mandate, isn't it? You've got to be seeking out where there might be troubles or where there might be issues. And, and you absolutely and your team smashed it regarding that particular episode and continue to do so. I wanted to ask you, if I may, though, um, the, it's absolutely vital and it's very important that, you know, and you guys do it really well, engaging with companies on the ESG front and, and looking at what's important. How do you get them? Because obviously there's some funds and some companies that are reluctant to go down the ESG route at the moment, you know. So how do you go about that, engaging them? more so um it's a really good question and it seems that we're very arm's length because we have a portfolio and in it is a whole series of underlying invest of funds and in theory they're all active managed so if you beta were managing an active fund you could say well what's to stop me holding one portfolio when i come in and see you and then hey ho i change it and it's something completely different the next day you have no knowledge of that at all. It's money in my fund and I can do as I, you know, you, you're empowering me to do that because you're not investing it directly. In practice, however, if you're trying to deliver an earning stream, you're trying to invest in companies that will grow their earnings in a more sustainable and more effective way over time. Mm. And those earnings are more likely to grow if they're doing the right thing and adopting the right practices from an environmental and a social and a governance and a climate change and every perspective. So engaging with the companies with whom you haven't, you know, you've hand selected those companies for your fund and engaging with them to, to help them along this route means you've got better insight. It's a tool that's been used for time immemorial by the best quality active managers. Okay, it wasn't called ESG, that acronym had yet to be um, um, sourced, it was just called engagement and people didn't note it, um, but they often did it. And actually, I can give you a brilliant example. Yesterday, I hopped on my bicycle from work and I went on my way home via one of our superb managers. This happens to be an unusual one. It's a very boutique. It only invests in one asset class. They're celebrating their 30th anniversary. I said to them, where's the cake? <laughs> you should be celebrating. We should know about this. And they said, oh. Yeah, well, we're, we're keeping it quiet. And then, well, we don't. This is to be in one asset class, you know, seven managers all in one asset class and still running is a real achievement. They're massively, Absolutely. they're ahead by, they're ahead of their index by about 8% year to date, which is fabulous. Oh, wow. And um, I was talking to them saying, look, your governance, your, your ESG report is great. You've come on strides. You've done fabulously. But I'm not seeing an awful lot on ENS climate carbon, biodiversity. Can you? Can I just ask you about this? Hey ho, would you believe it? They started talking about a company they invested in. I'm being really careful not to give you the names <laughs> to identify the manager. Um, and they said, well, we are investing in this company because they're using, and if I can get this right, a new method of blast furnaces for their steel. And this has a much, much lower carbon footprint than their competitor. Mm -hmm. And we think, because carbon pricing will come in, that this will allow the company to perform better and it can invest more over time. Da, 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 da. I thought, I said to them, this is exactly what I would have expected you to be doing. They engage with their company's masses. But unless you nudge them and say to them, please articulate what you're doing, they don't understand, they don't seem to understand the language that needs to be deployed to do that effectively. So in a way, I hope that we as a team can help just gently help those outstanding boutiques to demonstrate that actually they, on paper they may look poor, but they're actually great. Moreover, they don't use the voting agency uh, intelligence. They use the plumbing, but not the intelligence. They make all their own decisions, which saves them a revenue stream and stops groupthink. And then thirdly, the quality of their analysis is superior. So again, if you would, when you run them through a sustainalytics or a, um, we have a fantastic thing called the ES, Jupiter ESG hub that runs all the third party data on all the underlying positions within each fund. And when you run them through that, it doesn't look great. But actually, the work that they're doing is helping these companies to improve what they're doing. 
And that's where you get the elevation in the ESG score, which in turn attracts those who use ESG scores. We do less. Um, the only reason that we knew they were doing this work is A, because we've known them for a long time, but secondly, and more importantly, because we have something internally, which George Blessin developed when he first arrived. And it's called the Jupiter Merlin scoring matrix. And we ask each manager before they come in for their routine six monthly meetings, sounds like a dentist, isn't it? And we go through each tooth and have a look and see how the fillings are positioned. And is this one a little bit wobbly or is that company a little bit wobbly? And um, we also ask them, well, when did you last have that, that filling inspected? When did you last engage with that company? And what were you asking them about? And how much of that company do you own? And what was the outcome of that engagement? So we hold them to account to demonstrate positive outcomes from their engagements with companies. And that, I think, is what ESG should be about. It's not about exclusion. It's not about following distant third party analysis, be it the voting agencies, be it Sustainalytics, MSCI, or the other agencies. It's about hands on active stewardship that really makes a positive difference over time on occasion. It's tough to do well, but when it works, it's really cool. Brilliant. I've got two questions that attach to what you've just said. I'm going to just cut these very, very quickly now, Linda. Um, please could you share with our listeners the difference between highly rated ESG stocks and improving ESG stocks and why there tends to be an outperformance of the latter group. And you touched on it a little bit there regarding the, the scores uh, regarding certain companies. I'll give you an analogy, Peter. In a classroom, you're the teacher. If you engage with the kids who are sitting in the front row, who are listening already, and whose work is exquisite, how are you going to lift up the whole class? You're not massively. You'll just lift up those few. If you manage to engage with the guys who want to be at the back of the class, who are highly disruptive, who cause chaos at the first opportunity, the whole class will do better. But the uplift you get from those individuals is far greater. Brilliant. Read that. Fantastic response. Thank you. Now, the other aspect you touched on there as well, briefly, Amanda, I have, if I could ask you to discuss the irrationality of exclusion, I think is how you, you and your team phrased it, with regards to sustainable investing, often focusing on what is good today and not necessarily long term. Yes, there are so many facets of this. I'm trying to think how to do it in a couple of, how to cover it in a couple of minutes. Um, firstly, go back to the analogy if you completely ignore those kids they will fall out of the bottom they will end up being school leavers and 40 percent of prison inmates are kids who are excluded from school and the same is true as investments if you uh, exclude companies bad companies um, which are held in the indices by the way so if you're an index investor, you're investing your capital quite happily in these rubbish, dreadful companies. But I digress. Um, if you exclude these companies or indeed force companies to sell off the weakest parts of them. So, for example, coal is a great example. Where do those bits go? Well, typically they go into private hands, state owned enterprises, private equity Com companies that where there is no transparency or there's much less transparency, they don't have to have shareholders who have to meet them because there's an annual AGM. They have to have voting. They don't have people saying, by the way, how about a net zero, you know, this great idea of a net zero, excuse me, please, program. And, you know, where, how are you showing that you're progressing towards that? How are you, what are you paying your, your, your employees, when they get COVID, don't forget you in the US, there's no sick pay. Well, there certainly wasn't pre-COVID. There's no maternity pay. Or in other countries, they just simply lay them off and don't even think about it twice. So private companies are, are, are quite an issue because we hold listed companies to account, but there is no way to do the same and apply the same rigor to private companies. So if you exclude, you... Um, not only don't have the ability to engage and to bring on that uh, uh, that management team, but you also don't 
you also un depower those companies. So for example, oil and gas sector is still trading at very cheap multiples because so many people have excluded them. They can't invest in the way that they would wish to in renewable energy. They have got the technical expertise. They've got the wells. They've got the people. And they've got quite often quite deep purses as well. And a great example is EOG in the US. It's a mid cap. And the, the um, fund that we own has empowered that management to create carbon capture. They're literally re recapturing carbon that they've emitted and putting it mm. back, pumping it back into the spent wells. Well, you can't do that if you're a new startup. And not only does that obviously reduce the carbon footprint of EOG, but it actually has a real positive impact on the real world. But by excluding that company, you're divesting of it. You're excluding it from, from cash and from capital. Quite apart from the fact you might want to plug your phone in one day to be charged. And by the way, you might want you know, weapons to protect yourself. You might want copper because you might fancy an EV. Well, EVs we know use seven times the amount of copper versus a traditional combustion engine. You might want a new laptop, well, that's lithium. But if you divest of these dirty assets and just allow them to do whatever they want, is that really the way you're going to achieve real world outcomes? What incentive have they got to invest billions to make their production cleaner and better? They have none. So from a portfolio perspective and a performance perspective, when those asset classes are rallying, which they are at the moment, for very obvious and clear reasons, it's not a good idea. From an ethical perspective, in terms of trying to actually impact the real world, you know, we've got some serious challenges as on as ahead of us as a yes. generation. And by mm -hmm. just investing in, you know, the little companies that are trying to provide the solutions, that's fabulous. But you've actually got to move the mountain, not just Mohammed. And then thirdly, um, I've forgotten my third point, but I don't think it's a good plan, put it like that. No, I, I completely agree with that. And, and we've seen it um, over the last two years, the whole environment regarding ESG investment has accelerated and even more so since the geopolitical problems we've had regarding Ukraine and Russia. So it, it's a good thing. And also with that, the acceleration of accreditation and regulation of ESG has also moved on somewhat. So that's 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 the important point, I think. Very important and, and, um, and well worth doing. Now, Amanda, we're talking about ESG at the moment. And you have three teenagers, um, which also keeps you very, very busy. Um, teenagers in general are very well known to be extremely proactive and globally savvy regarding ethical brands, climate change, environmental issues, and all things ESG. Do you have some interesting conversations with your teenage children around the topics and issues? And if so, what are the areas that you all wholeheartedly agree on? And what do you disagree on? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. I think one of the ones that really woke me up was about five years ago, my 13-year-old daughter, <clears throat> sorry, I got from my throat, piped up and she said, Mommy, do you know how much how much water has been used for those jeans that you're wearing today? And I must have to confess, I actually hadn't a clue. And it's mind-boggling amount of water is needed to produce jeans. Mind-boggling amount of water actually produced needed to produce fabrics. And in the places where typically we outsource our production to, so emerging markets, the regulation and indeed the money to invest in doing so in a, in a sustainable way, particularly from a biodiversity perspective, is not there. So you see rivers that are wrecked, <laughs> literally. Um, and she woke me, woke me up to that actually. Um, I think we agree on an awful lot. I suppose they do sometimes call me an eco-warrior, which worries me. I say, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, so, so, well, maybe one thing that we're perhaps not so quite aligned on is every time you press a like, you know, that heart thing, that uses energy. There is no such thing as a cloud. It's all servers. And I do try and say to them, guys, do you realize that the emissions from servers are actually greater than the entire aviation industry. 
So please, could you come off your phone? <laughs> Doesn't always work. <laughs> I try. <laughs> um, perhaps, yeah, maybe just slightly different tack to others. Can try lots of different routes. Um, plastics, yeah, they're quite good. Sometimes they throw away plastics without washing them, putting them in recycles, which annoys me. We're getting there, slow work. Mm. Um, but on other things, they're, they're pretty good. So, uh, but as you write, it's, you rightly say it's a symbiotic relationship. I, I expect you probably have children and many of our listeners will as well. And it's a fantastic additional stream of noise, essentially. And it's really useful to know what they're thinking. And they're often ahead of us. Um, oh, yes. So it's really useful. I'm very grateful for them, actually. And I often ask when I come across teams of managers and they're all very similar age, all very similar in the way they seem to think about things. I often think to myself, you need a teenager. <laughs> you need a teenager in your group because you're missing out. I remember one group discussing mm -hmm. LK brands. I don't know if you remember LK brands. Yes, yes, I do. Tell me what they used to do. Just do all manner of different things, materials, um, clothing, perfumes, yep. all manner of, yeah, yeah. Victoria's oh, yeah. Secret bras. Mm. And I, I remember this group, word, yes. <laughs> this group of men saying, well, I don't understand how Victoria's Secret's doing so well. Mm. And I thought, you know, my 12-year-old boy could tell you that. He's had to watch yeah. the catwalks. <laughs> he can tell you why Victoria's Secret is also doing so well. It's on everybody's Christmas yeah. list, and it's not just oh, my yeah. children. <laughs> Absolutely. And not his, by the way, his sisters. But, um, mm. yeah, it, it just made me think. Yeah, anyway. Mm. Brilliant. Now, um, I'm going to change it up just a bit. The ch children, Amanda, do you have ISIS for them? If so, what's your investing style for them? And how do you go about selecting the investments for them, for them as well? I'll be honest, I'm, I'm um, maybe not a very diligent mother um, in that I'm quite time poor. And so I'm afraid I've taken the easy route and everything and everyone, me and them, sorry, they and me, um, are all in Jupiter Merlin growth. My mother's in Jupiter Merlin income. I, why would I not? My husband does his own thing. Bless him. <laughs> so that's your investment style and strategy. Now, is is that with regards to the children? Is that something that you do on a lump basis, or do you do a monthly sort of pound cost averaging um, strategy into into those funds for them and yourself? Um, it's to be honest, it hasn't been the same for each child it should be i know it is on the it is uh in the main but um when they hit certain birthdays we say to them okay we have this small sum and we want to introduce you to investing so we're going to put this poor sum i'm afraid we're choosing where it's going but we want you to become more aware of what it is what it means of performance of the impact of inflation because you're going to have to suffer that on your student loans as well um, but it also has an impact on investments and it had and obviously they're not homeowners or anything like that but we've used it as a way to try and introduce them to the world of finance and to looking after their own personal balance sheets you know i'm spending um two pounds on the bus well okay that goes on your spent this week and i wanted to buy a coffee well can you afford it sort of thing so teaching each child to do their own balance sheet essentially um which again has mixed reception but at least if they understand the theory when they need to hopefully they can apply the practice brilliant now amanda it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on the investing matters podcast with me i've got one final question with you if you'll indulge indulge me and this is a fun one so i hope you'll enjoy it so amanda you're the investment manager and esg director of jupiter independent funds team um, I'm going to give you the opportunity here to grant you one wish, right? The ultimate power to change one thing for the betterment of all that grace the planet that we call Earth. What would it be and why? Sorry, Peter, you'll need to repeat the question. One wish to change what? Anything to do with ESG, for the betterment, for the grace of the, all that are on the planet Earth. What would that be? It would be an awareness that every single person has a personal impact. Every single person makes choices and each choice has an impact. 
And I think if every single person were to sit down, wake up in the morning or sit down, whatever, and think about the impact of everything they do, the world would be a very different place. And I'll give you an example. When you wake up in the morning, when you, Peter, wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, perhaps, please could you perhaps lie in bed and think, okay, I'm going to brush my teeth. How long am I running the water for? What am I using to brush my teeth? Is it in a tube, plastic, or is it not? I'm washing. What, what, am I, what chemicals am I putting down the, the sink? We all know that water isn't recycled in the way it should be. What am I putting into the oceans? And what am I using upstream to create those? Okay, I'm getting dressed. Am I wearing nylons? Am I wearing um, fleeces that leach? They're made from oil and gas. They're, they're, they're synthetics. Are they leaching bioplastics into the water? I go downstairs. What's the footprint of my the food that I'm eating, the carbon footprint of it? How has it been sourced? Where's it come from? Am I, am I eating sensibly in terms of eating stuff that's about to go off? I'm not throwing things away. What examples am I giving by what I'm eating and how I'm behaving? I plug in my phone. Did I remember to turn it off last night? So it's not being used. It's not um, using, it's not on sleep mode because it still uses energy when it's on sleep mode. Why not just turn it off? Um, sometimes I forget. And the same with your laptops and tablets and anything that's on the wall, it should be switched off on the wall. It, because you're saving energy. We, we could really, really change so much for the better if we just thought a little bit about how we live our lives and how we consume. We don't have to make big swinging changes all the time. Just every little thing will make a difference. So I'd love to empower people to just be so much more careful and thoughtful about what they do and the impact of what their behaviors have. Brilliant. I love that response. Thank you ever so much for sharing that with me. Um, Amanda Sillers, Investment Manager and ESG Director at Jupiter Independent Funds team. Thank you ever so much for kindly sharing your insights and wisdom with me on this Investing Matters podcast. It's been an absolute delight, Amanda. Thank you. Take care and God bless you. And thank you. Okay, all of us. Bye.